Um, in case you're thinking, yeah, the agenda says building your cloud environment is the DevOps way. That was my intended session. <laughs> uh, but I recently changed customers and the head of IT told me, well, no problem, you can use our Azure environment. Just please don't break anything. <laughs> so yesterday afternoon, I tried to log on and do some final tests. And uh, yeah, I changed customers and the HR department did their job. They removed <laughs> my account. <laughs> so I was a little bit like, no! And that's why I wasn't at the ice bar last evening. I was creating this session. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been at a few customers. Uh, some have Azure, some have AWS. And I contacted the AWS customer with the request, can I use the code I've written for you in this presentation? And he said, yeah, sure because I have intellectual property, so yay. But he did make the request not to share it on GitHub or whatever, just show it and show you my way of thinking. So, talking about my. Um, my name is Jeff Wouters. You may recognize a little accent. I'm not American or Scottish, I'm Dutch. So any Dutchies here? Well, and Tim, you're honorary Dutch, so. <laughs> you listen, uh, Amsterdam, right? Yeah. Yeah, Amsterdam. So I'm an MVP for Windows PowerShell. I'm a learnaholic. So whenever I start, the moment I started full time working, I also started my evening classes. So last week I finished my bachelor in psychology. So woohoo! <laughs> and master is in progress. And I founded the Dutch PowerShell user group. So what we will cover, a little bit of theory, a little bit of practical experiences, like the walls I ran into, hard, and the AWS uh, fun project. Um, eventually I'll show you that uh, Mark 1 uh, took me quite a lot of time, because I didn't know AWS, hell, I didn't know declarative syntax back then, at all. So it also introduced me to JSON, that was also a lot of fun. Uh, then Mark 2 came along and Mark 3 actually cost me one weekend. And I'll show you why. And it's a little bit the same approach like Ian Brighton did. So I was watching his session and I was like, hmm, great minds think alike. <laughs> so first I want to tell you a story about a guy probably. Um, that had a little bit of code. He'd written it, and then his colleague or manager came along and he said, can I trust this code? Does it work? Does it break, did it break anything? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> so, <coughs> test it. Test every little piece of code you've written. And you'll find out that in Mark III, I've functionized everything. Uh, yeah, I kind of want to mention it. Uh, Carl Webster, the guy that's written documentation script, version point point zero 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 one or whatever of the script, was basically 4,000 lines of code. Woof. No functions. Um, and then we started functionizing it a little bit that makes it reusable and etc. So for me, uh, a function is a unit, a unit you can test. And a unit you can, if written correctly, reuse. And I basically wanted to uh, give you some uh, cat tags. So, <laughs> so a little pra practical thingy, new CNF stack. CloudFormation, uh, CFN, sorry, typo, CFN stack. Um, apparently, you can create a, a JSON file, and you can, new CFN stack, you can use that one to create CloudFormation stack on the Amazon Web Services. Oh, great! Only the API is limited to, I believe it was 32 KB, the file. And trust me, when you have a few subnets, maybe one server, etc., you'll hit 30 take 32 KB very quickly. So solution, put the file on E3 storage. 
and tell the cloud stack in, uh, instead to, hey, I've got a file on E3 storage, use that one. What a lot of people don't know is that if you use new CFM st uh, stack uh, without hitting the API limit, in the background it places the file on E3 storage. So it's a rather annoying limit in the API and it is uh, technically it is documented, but not very well. Hmm? No, okay. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of the code I uh, written. I found that the AWS PowerShell module, uh, I literally posted the tweet, the AWS PowerShell module is crap. <laughs> Within two hours, I got a response from the AWS.NET team. Hey, um, we see you're an MVP, so if you have any tips or advice, well, welcome. So I wrote them a Word document, 41 pages. <laughs> uh, I have to say that a lot of it was copy paste by uh, uh, parameters with uh, named after the plural, stuff like that. It is not the way it, PowerShell is intended, it works just fine. Um, but that was also like five pages, so that brings us up to 41 pretty quick. So, first the demo, the wrong ways. And I say wrong in between code quotes because it is a way. I don't think it's the most efficient way. First of all, this is a cloud formation that bleh, this used to be. <laughs> Come on. There we go. This is a cloud formation template, and I hope I can. Yeah, Sublime doesn't zoom in. So, for the people in the back, uh, it is JSON. It is a lot of fun if you don't know it. Um, yeah, for me it was a pain in the ass. The beauty about this, it is very well documented. So, this, all of this, <coughs> I created basically out of three examples found on the internet. And Mike Pfeiffer isn't here this time. He was last year in Amsterdam. He works for Amazon and his only job is to write this stuff. Templates, examples. That's pretty neat. <coughs> There's still no tooling part. Shh. <laughs> That's uh, a few tabs later. Um, <coughs> So, first of all, I will be showing you every now and then 5,765 lines of code. I will not be covering them line by line, don't worry. <laughs> don't have the time for that. So, let's use IC steroids for now, because I do really like the function, uh, what's it called? Function browser, function thingy. Welcome. Now I hope it. Ah, the one. This thing. Select. <coughs> Thank you. So, what you can see is I've written a few functions. So instead of using um, cloud formation declarative syntax, I'm building all of it. Pen file, password data. Ah, there we go, instance. I'm doing all of this by hand. Uh, imperative syntax. It kind of negates the whole idea of cloud formation. It's like a DSE concept. You set it once and the system will fix itself. But the customer wanted uh, something as quickly as possible and it needed to be automated via PowerShell or a version of it. So for me, this was a yeah, nasty quick fix. Then I was like, well, that cloud formation thing. How does it work? So I show you the template. What I literally done is take the template and create a humongous string. 
and fill in the gaps. This is not how you should do it, by the way. This is by far not the most efficient way. The reason I'll show you, and that's down. Oh, this, by the way, is one block for the Windows instance. Just to give you an idea why you shouldn't do this. Da -da. That's painful. Yes, it was. <coughs> so, what I've done here is, uh, well, my cool. Yeah. Um, two parameters, the customer name and what kind of environment this is. In their case, they were using development, test, exercise, production, training and demo. The idea is, if uh, it was so terrible by then, they were hosting their internal Hyper-V Hyper environment, three servers. They were cracking out of their uh, chassis because they were so busy. And the moment sales was in Arabia giving a demo at a customer, the developers got a phone call, please don't run a build right now, we're giving a demo. <laughs> because of performance issues. So the Hyper-V environment wasn't tuned at all. It was just next, next, finish, install. Uh, and even after I tuned it, and I tuned it the best I could, there were still huge issues. So the company decided to move to a cloud. And they decided for legal reasons, Amazon. Then they, I came in, so I was kind of uh, yeah, limited by their choice. And it did give me a lot of fun. Um, I even had a small shout out by the Amazon team uh, for the 41 pages I sent them with requests, basically. <laughs> um, so what you'll see here is that I'll create a file, <coughs> start CF file, I'm adding the parameters, adding parameter key pair, etc, etc, etc. So for parameters, there are multiple parameters, for each type of parameter I've written the, its own function. That's, remember, it's just a humongous string right now I'm building. First of all, it's memory consuming. Second of all, what if at the end? Uh, yeah, scripting. I generated it and, ah, darn, I need to change one IP address. Regenerate the entire thing. That's not efficient at all. Um, maybe I can show you. Let's try it. Yeah, too bad. <coughs> Oop. Ah, <laughs> um, I have no credentials anymore. <laughs> so the template I've shown you, that's basically the file that uh, comes out of this. Mm. Yeah. So, this is some of the PowerShell code I used to create the feedback I gave. How, how long did you use to do that? It doesn't seem like a weekend. No, that wasn't a weekend. That was like uh, at least a month. It was a lot of pain. Yeah. Um, so when I can I do this? Yeah, and this I can use. And <coughs> show you. This will take some time, so let's continue to the next one. Commands that have unapproved verbs. Trust me, there were a few. And I did it like this instead of using get verb because I was under the impression uh, that get verb had some hard coded values in there. Well, not exactly. They were calling a .NET class. And whenever a uh, verb is added, a Windows update comes along and updates the .NET class. So pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, so I did it the hard way. Not the most efficient way, as usual in my case, but... Um, yeah, this was... This was not 
included in this one, but uh, basically you also written some code that uh, looks at mandatory parameters that don't take pipeline input. Well, if it is a get command, I okay, it's a gray area. But for me, any other command that has a mandatory parameter, I think should take input from the pipeline. I don't know if anybody, everybody disagrees with that. Please shout out. Jun, maybe? Yeah, I, I think I can think of times when it's not necessary, but... Okay. We can only take one thing from the command line, so if you've got two mandatory parameters, then you can't really do... Unless it's using automatic for each. Then it can yeah. take way more than one. From a pipeline? Yeah. Uh. You can only pipe one object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can only pipe one object. Oh, at a time. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they've all been the same type. Yeah. Or derived from the same type. Ah, there we go. <coughs> well, there were a few. But default, default OS, that is apparently a parameter name. Default OS isn't a plural. So. We still needed to go through the status, also ends with an S, uh, it isn't a plural, so we needed to go through this list and yeah, give it another review. But right now they're, if I'm correctly, they're almost, all of them are fixed, but there were at least 20 of them. And it isn't anything that will break, just to be clear about that, but I have an OCD and that's annoying. So, quick question: Do you know if they just created new al aliases then, or and kept the old one as well? Backwards compatibility, or oh, backwards compatibility is a reason why they didn't include some of my feedback, because they do weren't able to make it backwards compatible. Alias it. Uh, yeah, yeah, an, yeah, an, an alias. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but yeah. uh, alias that was uh, included, yeah. but some other of my feedback they. Uh, Basically, we're limited by some things they explained it to me uh, in developer's language. So, um, then I came along with a hey, that AWS instance that takes, a, for example, a profile name. It didn't work with uh, in IntelliSense at all. There were no validation sets or whatever. So I was like, why not? And the validation set is hard coded. So I kind of wanted to query the system and let the system provide the answers for IntelliSense. Use the dynamic parameter for that. Not probably the most efficient way again, it worked. Um, but IntelliSense has a timeout. So if the system takes longer than the timeout, yeah, no IntelliSense still. So that also was a learning curve. Now we get to my weeks of fun and this is basically a cloud formation for a template that generates with a network address translation and a single server just to be clear it took 910 lines that's crazy by the way if this is the code you want i can provide you so <laughs> They're not using that. Um, this is one for NAT, one server and a peering connection, and it took 967 codes, <laughs> the lines. So, my point being, uh, I did it a certain way. Later, I did realize, nah, not the most efficient way. And I continued on this. So it is a huge investment to basically decide, okay, what I've done so far, I think it's wrong. Let's redo the entire thing in a different way. And I told uh, my manager that I wanted to do this and he was like, <laughs> you're doing that in your own time. <laughs> this works for us? Great. I have to note that the moment I was finished with my doing it in my own time, I was able to declare the time and uh, make the, them pay for it because they really like my solution. 
Uh, I'm not showing that one. That's basically the same, but uh, with uh, remote desktop gateway. Now I get to how does these uh, templates compare to the ones I know from uh, Azure? Yeah, it's the same thing. Same really. Yeah, it's JSON, just a different name, different different, uh, different syntax. Yeah, well, well, no, the can, syntax is same, but the properties. Yeah. Same, same, same thinking behind it. So CloudFormation, there's nothing in AWS that you can't deploy. And it was a company made of uh, like 100 developers and 20 other people. Um, they were using Amazon and they're also now using uh, Azure. So what they wanted eventually, and that's way beyond what I did, uh, was have a single API, a single command, if you will, to create a subnet either on AWS or on Azure. Uh, but that's a command. We're using declarative syntax, right? So there is a company out there that has a product that does this, and it's called Fragrance. Mm -hmm. So they're using that right now. But the problem with that is, if Azure comes out with a new feature, and that of course almost never happens, but like every week, mm -hmm. um, Fragrance is behind. And if you really want to use the latest and greatest of Azure, then use the Azure syntax, uh, um, ARM. If you have the luxury to wait, wait. So, what I'm doing now is a new cloud cloud formation command. Uh, sorry. Well, explaining, I'll put on some power. Um, basically, I'm creating a single ob uh, object with uh, properties that are basically also objects. After that, I, you can fill in uh, the values and to, for practical reasons, I'll just show you what I'll end up with. You're making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what can happen? Can break? Come on. <laughs> Where does it I think it's back there. Over here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> I feel violated. <laughs> so, there's a variable right now created that has used to have more. And there is, by the way, a chance that I'll be able to share this. But we're talking about the, uh, yeah, the kind of want to show the world like, hey, we're doing cool stuff. But for legal reasons, they kind of don't want to uh, put their name on it. So I'm like, yeah, then you're negating the whole we're doing cool stuff, right? <laughs> uh, there we go. Right. There we go. So, I have a property. I'm not having the best day of <laughs> demos. <Jeff>. Yeah. <laughs> and we're back in five, four, three, two, one, go. <laughs> <laughs> So, I've got my object, parameters, and you can edit it if you like. After that... Jimmy, convert JSON now. So this is your... You're ruining my demo! This is your uh, <laughs> custom object, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's custom object, we missed the custom object.
there we go. So, I like PowerShell, and this is for me a PowerShell-like way of creating a cloud formation template. This I like. Yeah, because doing it, yeah, doing it the, the AWS PowerShell way. Yeah, doesn't no. So, um, luckily, I'm an MVP, and every now and then I ask the other MVP some stupid questions. Uh, amongst them was yeah. this little thingy, yeah. the yeah. depth yeah. parameter. Default yeah. two, otherwise, is it two? Hmm? It's two is it default is two, yeah. So I was seeing, I was generating something, and <laughs> what's my stuff? <laughs> so I started <laughs> rating my own convert, convert to JSON. <laughs> 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 and I'm not sure re who it was, but I believe it was uh, Joel. He was like, you know, there's a depth parameter, right? And I'm like, serious? <laughs> <laughs> so, conclusion, RTFM. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm willing to bet there's something like a 50-50 that June actually wrote the article, so... Convert to JSON, yeah. <laughs> I didn't read your stuff. Bet me. <laughs> yeah, but if the um, depth parameter default value is not useful, and I agree that it should be at 99 least or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it should be at least. <laughs> um, well, then that's a that thing that we could all get together and vote. Try yeah. converting a file system object with no. yeah. 99. No. Because it has nested things. I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not my uh, cup of tea. That, uh, <coughs> oh well. So then we got to the thing called passwords. Because who was at uh, Dave's session about uh, secure passwords and etc.? Great. So AWS is using PEM files. It is a standard and you can encrypt stuff and encrypt and all. But again, I never worked with that. And actually, this is very well documented. Because apparently they were seeing, hmm, maybe some issue uh, people will run into issues like this. And it's a four-line uh, script you can find all over on the internet <coughs> of getting the password and using it. And yeah, the latest line, connect to it. A practical thing, um, if you are using GitHub, and you place your pen file on GitHub publicly, you will actually get an email from Amazon on your, uh, not your GitHub account, but the account the pen file is registered to, like, hey, we found on this and this repository your secure <laughs> file, basically something like a certificate thingy. You well, may want to remove that from, yeah. uh, well, just to be clear, we disabled it for you. <laughs> yeah, because by then somebody else has already got it. There are people who oh yeah scan GitHub for private yeah. keys and, and luckily we were still in uh, development phase by then. But if it's production, mm, yeah. And if you're using your pen files all over your infrastructure in AWS, and you have to for some reason uh, replace the pen file, there are two options. Go in everywhere and re replace the references or recreate the environment. So, yeah, it's kind of logical. So please don't put that thing on public places. And like I said, the API has a limit of 30-ish K, I believe. Um, first of all, bucket name, DSC configuration is just one of the names I was using. But the bucket name needs to be unique throughout AWS. That's annoying. So, really uh, watch out for that because the moment you want to create something, you will get an error if it's somewhere in the world already existing. Yeah. 
that was some one of the feedbacks uh, of mine they didn't uh, yeah include in the fixes because it's a design choice and my best practice is to have something like a two or three letter acronym for your company and use that in front of it yeah i think that's only if you use the the default url so the the aws region one if you give it, yeah. you give your own dns name you can you oh yeah then, then uh, whatever Float. yeah um, and the trick I found, there isn't a command like upload to this bucket. So what you need to do is create a file and then write content to the file. Or, uh, sorry, write the object to the bucket. So first create the file locally and then write the file to the bucket. Uh, going back for people that have seen Ian's session this kind of looks familiar right you are also building a PowerShell object and go from there so for me ever since I found this way of doing it I'm always doing it like this. I'm always building PowerShell objects. The reason the then we'll do it like this. You basically can convert to anything. PowerShell has so many convert to commandlets. It makes you flexible. And Eh, darn. I did something wrong. But it also works the other way around. So for me, the practical thing, I can um, either regenerate a configuration template, or I can copy and paste the templates I already have, convert them uh, from JSON to a PowerShell object, just change the customer name, and then write it back. And write it to their yeah. environment. So that's the easy way to design my custom object. Just convert from JSON. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Of course. Yeah. That was an eye opener for me too, by the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah, we use it. It's a lot. It's easy to do that serialization and deserialization. So you're going to and from storing on disk and all that sort of messy stuff. There, there are some very uh, eccentric syntax thingies in JSON that if you convert from it will barf all over yeah I think if you, as long as you stick to integer strings and you just nest yeah. objects with you know integers and strings and stuff and you've got custom object types you've got to use um, CLI XML and yeah, good luck trying to generate that on your own so I don't know if you guys have had problems with it but there is a limit with the convert uh, from JSON of 2 megabytes yeah so at the current time, there is if you have larger JSON files, you actually can't use the uh, native commandlets. Yeah. That's not in the help. It's in the error message, probably. It's in the general error. Put it on and let So if you create a. Um, what did you say? Too many? Yeah. Too many. If you create a, a JSON file for CloudFormation, um, you, you're able to put a tag on just about anything. So that's where I hide my uh, customer name. Any single object within the AWS environment, I want to tag. Either it's internal, it's uh, for this customer, etc. Next, <coughs> I want to have a tag for what kind of environment is this. That way I can use PowerShell again to query the AWS environment for all my customers and fish out the objects that belong to a single customer or a single customer <coughs> and a specific environment.
let's say you have a cloud formation. It's up and running. Uh, let's say it's a demo environment. And you're like, yeah, I don't need it anymore. In the beginning, I started to remove all the things by hand. And then I was kind of surprised after I was done. I was going back at the first one and I was like, hey, it's back. Because, hey, that's the whole idea of CloudFormation. So there's a remove the event stack commandlet. Uh, it removes the stack and Amazon will handle everything for you uh, of removing the stuff. By default, things that are in use by maybe also another cloud stack, it is possible. It will error on that, unless you say force. So watch out with the force parameter. Oh, and tag, um, it is a, an array of hash tables. No, it's an array of uh, AWS dot uh, tag, I believe. So it has its own uh, type, and it will only, if you use the imperative syntax, it will not eat a hash table. It, you will get errors you will not understand. So if you're using imperative syntax, Amazon has its own types for everything. It is very well documented, but it is intended not for AWS PowerShell, but AWS has also some command line thingy, never used it. And this is extremely well documented, uh, but it is focused for developers, also the documentation. So once you get the hang of reading MSDN, for example, also this kind of documentation will become pretty easy to read. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Wow. I actually timed it for once. Work, work, yes. So, it's all about the object, not strings. Yes, you, like I showed you, I, you can <coughs> generate a humongous string. I don't think you wanna. Well, showing you this. And who calls himself or herself a scripter? Sure? No? Who doesn't call himself a scripter? Okay, who, who calls himself a coder? <coughs> Come on, Toby, you can do it. <laughs> Anybody has seen Full Metal Jacket? <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea behind the quote is, uh, within companies, developers uh, get quite a lot of uh, tooling and uh, budget for to make sure their code works, it is maintained, etc. Scripters are like, oh yeah, I'll script that for you. Done. Okay. It's not that quick. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> 18 months for me. <laughs> so, uh, point I'm trying to make here. Uh, versioning, for one. Source control, number two. And actually, that's number two and three. Number one, standardize. Not only you, but within your team. Uh, there are some .NET uh, coding guidelines out there, even for other coding guidelines from PowerShell these yeah, days. Yeah, there is there's something up on um, uh, PowerShell or, or, uh, or PowerShell or PowerShell. No, but there is something. It is a guideline. Look at it as ETIL. Who loves ETIL? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so. With ETIL, I always say, use what you kind of want, what you need, what's applicable to you, and drop the rest. Yeah. Every now and then look back, and hey, is there something in there we can use right now? But that's it. The same as the coding guidelines. 
uh, recently was in a customer for about a half year where they were not using PowerShell at all, but they were forced to. And they went from no PowerShell knowledge to quite extensive because a lot of them were Linux guys and they were eating this up like, like candy. PowerShell. Was a, wow, hey, different piping. Hey, the tools are works, etc. And those guys got budget because they were standardizing, and they had reusable code, they had a repository, uh, but it was kind of an illegal repository. They built their own server, put something on there, and yeah, we knew it was there. Management did it, security <laughs> didn't at all. There were password sorts in their plain text. So. Um, and the moment security sees stuff like that, they are flipping out. And you know how to get budget? Get security behind you. It will open doors like crazy. And behind you, not in front of you. So don't look at this as a, as a script, as a tiny little thingy. Be uh, precious about it. And specifically, it's not just a script. It's a critical tool. <coughs> Many scripts run production environments. If all the scripts are taken away, it's a good matter of time before something breaks. And if you want to contact, contact me, well, hey, looking at the name, do you see a trend here? <laughs> do. And looking at the time, that's a demo I will not get to. But those are scripts I can share, actually, and I will share. Um, I've written quite a few scripts to just make my uh, Amazon AWS life easier. Query a little thing, put a tag on it, etc. So those things I will share. I don't know if it will be on GitHub or on my blog. Don't know yet. Both. Both? Both? <laughs> yeah. That sounds like manual labor two times. Yeah, yeah, I put it in GitHub. Yeah, uh, and a link. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> and make an thank object you. Making objects in its two posts, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> make an object in its two posts, right? Tempting. <laughs> <laughs> it is standardized. <laughs> <laughs> so, question then. Obviously, you've got a lot of time invested in AWS. Not necessarily for, you know, personal choices, but if we were, Azure. I don't have a customer with Azure that allows me to do this. I have to add that to it. But yeah. No, does AWS give you everything you need? It gave everything that customer needed. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. And obviously, Azure, they're, they're pretty similar, they've got different names and all of the services are similar. Just from your perspective, now that you've invested time in AWS, you're gonna have to learn it all again. Oh. For sure, you know, and as soon as you, as soon as you, well, a lot of the, a lot of the services are the same, but they're implemented in totally different ways. Yes. So of course you go to Azure, and you're going to be out of touch on AWS because things change, you know, on a, on a weekly type of. Yes, and that's why, if I'm able to release the object creation thing, then I will do it on GitHub, and just throw it in the community, and anybody can contribute. Yeah. I was planning with that uh, with my AD Health check. But because I'm writing uh, the thing in C sharp and licensed, I'm not doing it. So, but this one, yeah, sure. Yeah. Any other? I just get fed up with the we have an extraction and an abstraction, and there's another level of abstraction. So you know, see the the, the CloudFormation stack is an abstraction, is your resource manager templates are an abstraction of all the underlying resources, and now we need another level of abstraction on the top to you know abstract the individual. And then there's going to be something else, and you know, where'd you stop? Okay, in that case, here we go. I just left a customer that was basically a merger of two companies. One, uh, both were doing hosting. One, Windows-based, a little bit of Linux. The other, a Linux-based and a little bit of Windows. So, hey, good combination, right? But they both written their own declarative syntax abstraction tooling for their environment. 
So instead of uh, rewriting both tools, they decided to put up a third team to write an abstraction layer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's just the way the world seems to be going. You know, they're, they're adding more and more layers on to abstract away, and yeah. it doesn't stop. And also with abstraction layers, uh, the above abstraction layer can't create something before it's available in the underlying abstraction layer. So you're always walking behind. Yeah. And uh, like I said, these days Azure comes out with features. Is it month or weekly? Every three weeks. Yeah, that's nuts. Nobody can keep up with that. Mm. It's worse than PowerShell. It would be great if this OJ could be adopted to better extent. Mm. Yeah, however, really I would think that um, commandlets, at least uh, for uh, Azure, because hey, it's one product, there is uh, there should be some consistency in there, right? <laughs> well, some, yeah. <laughs> but it really smells to me like there are many different teams working on those commandlets. Because one does it... It's on GitHub, so it's not just teams working on it. It's community also. Yeah, absolutely. Great. In fact, it's majority community now. The first 20 or so, 20 commandlets in Azure Resource Manager and about the first 40 in Azure Service Manager were done by the Microsoft Teams and after that it was all community. And there are something nice. like 701 and 500 and one beautiful uh, way of thinking, uh, Marco Zinovich gave a talk, I believe, at Tech at Barcelona, the last time it was there, the final time it was later there, but, um, where he told us that uh, you have basically three flavors of Azure. Uh, Azure China, Azure, right, China. Uh, Azure Microsoft Azure, but also uh, Azure uh, locally. And Jeffrey Snover gave a talk that was even the fourth right now, uh, I'm not keeping up anymore, but the idea is to have one commandlet for all four environments. And the moment you connect to an environment, the uh, commandlet automatically says, hey, you're connected to this one, so I need to go there. And that's a single way of... Hmm? And that's a single way of management, and that will be covered in my next talk. That's tomorrow somewhere. Ish. So, well, it's not the day after. <laughs> <laughs> I have to fly back actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. You're welcome.